Yes, we are live and we have been doing an awesome series here on the Dr. Baj channel, which is true to form for how I like to live my life and do uh, the education, run my medical clinic, raise my family, and that is authentic. <laughs> and that means I am uh, a real human being that struggles to change behavior. I have looked over the last uh, 20 plus, 25 years almost now of seeing patients knowing that when you change behavior, you need a whole lot less prescriptions than when you don't change behavior. I have uh, been using James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, in this series. And this is uh, lesson number six on that, where we are trying to weave in how to real, live, struggling human beings do it. And the truth is, it's just as hard for me as it is for other people to change a behavior. But there are some hacks. There are some really important lessons on changing behavior. We started out the series with some little tiny steps of change. And then I asked you to do some important reflection moments, which was to write down some things that would, would not have been easy for anyone, but especially if you're trying to change behavior, I asked you to write those down. And then we started looking at how do you uh, add up your habits and that you are the sum of your habits, that when we want to change them, you must change your identity when you change a habit. And if you skip that part, you're gonna relapse. Ask me how I know. <laughs> and watching to see when a bad habit is uh, forming, what are the things we do to distance ourselves from it? And what things will we do over the next few weeks? We're gonna talk about how to make things more attractive. Um, I will tell you that motivation is overrated. We talked about that a little bit last week. We're gonna get deeper in that tonight. And that if you are looking for some blinding, that's what we're gonna to do tonight. We're gonna to teach you how to unsee or the importance of blocking uh, your vision for the temptations. So uh, we'll get to that in just a minute, but I do wanna say thank you for everybody who, the volume is low, I can, I can fix that. Volume is low. Mm -hmm. Let's see if that improves it. And Okay, volume is turned all the way up, and uh, we've got some thumbs up from the rest of you, so I think we're okay. Last but not least, uh, so we have a, um, a few things that we are going to talk about here on the Dr. Bob Show. Uh, we have a tradition, and that is I share my numbers. I was about to do that in the last section, but now that I know you're all here, um, it's great to see that everybody, um, everybody has... Um, checked in and I would love it if you have questions. We do answer questions at the end of the show, but that uh, is limited to the those who write in first. So go ahead and write in your questions and we have a team of people that are helping to do, um, to get those gathered for me. So first of all, I'm gonna start by just saying, um, I will check my numbers, but I've had a rough 48 hours. That, um, I lost video, let's hope we didn't lose video. Um, uh, video stopped. Let's see here. All right, hope hope the rest of you can still see a video. Um, as I look at this, it is the hardest part about watching comments. Is you have to watch comments on a live, but uh, sometimes when one thing happens, it'll distract me. So I'm checking my numbers, but I do my best to fast for for some time on Sunday through the show, which is Tuesday night. So. Yes, it is about a 48 hour fast that I work for. Um, thank you for affirming that the video is fine. Um, and as I fasted this week, yesterday I drove home and my frustrations from the, um, from the previous uh, 12 hours at the office led to quite uh, the irritation. I got home and I did that thing that I shouldn't do. I walked in the front door so yeah, ketones 3.1, I'm actually impressed by that, and my glucose is 65. But if there had been food around the last five hours, I totally would have eaten. <laughs> if it wouldn't have been for this show, I would have totally screwed up and eaten because I have had a heck of a time. Uh, but I got home yesterday, I did that thing I shouldn't do, I walked in the front door, I opened the fridge, and we eat liver sausage at my house. It's actually one of my favorite things. It's very keto, <laughs> it's very fattening, um, but it's a childhood comfort for me. And usually when the package is sealed, there's no problem. But I opened the fridge door, 
and I smell Braunschweiger, I just had to <laughs> have a bite. So the trouble is, is once you start fasting, and I'm, I'm pretty practiced, I do this weekly. Once you start fasting, uh, the hardest part is the hunger that happens right after that last meal. And then you reach into a zone that is, uh, your leptin gets better, your so appetite, appetite is suppressed, you even get a little growth hormone if you've been doing this long enough like I have. And when I get Dr. Bob's numbers like that, oh, thank you for calculating that, that ratio, Patrick. A Dr. Bob's ratio of 18, I feel good. But I swear, if you, I would have checked this about six, five or six hours ago when another wave of setbacks hit me and I was so irritated. In fact, one of the things that was happening is my YouTube video was swirling. I couldn't log in and set up the show. So a few minutes ago when it wasn't working, I thought, oh no, it's still happening. Uh, but that uh, irritation is one of my triggers uh, to eat, to just find something comforting to eat. And it's a good thing I didn't have access to it about five hours ago. And it's a good thing you're all here watching me because I, I take a lot of, not pressure, just like accountability for, I start my day with a support group on Tuesdays. I get to hear about some setbacks. We're gonna talk about some good stories on the show tonight. And, I share them when I am frustrated. I am gonna be drinking some BHB tonight. I don't know how high I'll be able to raise a ketone of 3.1, but we'll do my best. Uh, I do have some announcements. This is the first announcement, and that is that tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern time, I will be on something called Clubhouse. So if you haven't done this before, it's like an audio uh, podcast that's live, and I'll be interviewed about the, the content that we're doing at the, um, Keto Orlando um, event. So tune in. I, I get to meet uh, a re talk to Julia, I think her name is, uh, who's one of the main leaders of the event, and she has invited me to speak, and we're going to do a little interview, and you get to answer some questions. So go ahead and um, download uh, Clubhouse, create an account, and then there is a, 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 a link that I'll have my team share that this will be what we um, you click on tomorrow night to be present for that. So I also put that link in the show notes. All right, announcement number two is Keto Orlando. So if you um, haven't signed up for this, it is probably, I think, a very, um, it's, I don't know if I can call it my favorite because I haven't been to it yet, but when I look at the outline, it is so heavy on education, which is what I love. I love taking the time to be able to really engage in um, authentic discussions about how do you improve a ketogenic journey? How do you help them really get off of medications? And I believe my topic at this one is the, um, I had a couple of my signed up for, I don't know if I'm doing autoimmune at this one as well as the one in Austin, um, or if I'm doing um, how do I stay consistently keto? What do I tell my patients? So things I can't say on YouTube <laughs> that I don't, I don't wanna get in trouble for, I don't wanna give medical advice, but wow, I'm really excited about what they have for a lineup. And as always, I love meeting some of the other speakers. You feel like there's this bubble around you when you don't get to interact with other people leading folks on the ketogenic journey. So if you haven't signed up for that, I'm very, very excited to teach about that. Um, next, I wanna make sure to put this little promo code up here uh, because last week I showed off a, uh, a kit that there were 130 of them left last week when we did the live. And there are still about 35 or 40 kits left where you get a 50% discount off of a meter. I am always looking for ways for my uh, patients and my friends and family and the folks that watch the show to get the resources as, as cheap as possible. And I have never seen the meter this cheap. You, you, you are, it comes with a kit of uric acid. And this past weekend, I've been reading uh, Dr. Pulmutter, um, uh, Pulmutter's, um book about called Drop Acid, and um, which I knew a ton of it, but it's so nice to hear the affirmations of what the research, you know, why I chase it, why I look at it, and he does a great job of educating about it, but I'm checking every one of my family members uric acid as they come home for Easter this next weekend. So um, get the kit, you get 10 strips. The reason it's so discounted is these strips will expire in August of this year. So um, I'll tell you, you should be checking uric acid for all of these other reasons. I think of it as the long game for how you measure autophagy. 
Um, when people have lost the weight and they say, Doc, can I go off the keto diet and add back a bunch of the carbs? I will tell them, great, I'm so happy to see that your blood pressure's normal, your blood sugars are much better, you've lost the weight, you feel good. Uh, but the true test of time and one of the hardest numbers to change is uric acid. Uh, I think of it as the the grit in your system, in your body, that is around because of chronic inflammation. And you can reverse it, you can lower it, but you gotta check it more than your insurance will ever let you check it. So this is a great tool, point of care. I think this is where medicine is going. So um, I, I, I highly encourage, if you don't have a meter, cheapest way to get a meter. And if you haven't checked your uric acid, there's gonna be some great lectures of that coming up soon. So I would, I would invest. All right, a couple more speaking events. KetoCon is coming up and you do have a link that I will be, it's in the show notes, but also I'll put in the, uh, put in the um, chat here. I'll have one of my teammates do that by putting the link in the chat. And um, I, I get to talk about the autoimmune disorders here. I'll tell you the last time I gave one of these lectures, it was on the cancer. Uh, I just aired that a couple weeks ago. Uh, I think the cancer video took me over a hundred hours. I was looking at how long it took me to make those slides. A hundred hours of not just researching, but getting the slides to be in a teachable format in a playful enough way that you don't lose the attention of the newbie, but that you satisfy the more advanced learner. And I am really trying to thread that needle for this autoimmune lecture. It's not until July and I am already like, um, not stressing, but definitely concerned. How am I going to be able to help uh, that newbie understand as well as the advanced person understand autoimmune disorders and why does the ketogenic diet help them so much? It's a great lecture. Um, that's like, that, that promo code is not the right one for this one. Let's take that away. Uh, oh no, not that guy. Yeah, it's up here. Uh, take away uh, this and add um, promo code Dr. Boz. Okay, and then there's one more, one more of these that I need. Promo code uh, Bosworth is the one for um, the Metabolic Health Summit. This is my education. Last week I, I, I announced this as well, and I'm really excited about how I get to go learn. So even if this isn't your thing, um, when you use the promo code, you get a few, a few percentage points off, but it's really my way to virtual signal this conference that if it weren't for conferences like the Metabolic Health Science, which are very doctory, they're very filled with medical articles, but it is what I am hungry for. It's what I look for and can't always uh, translate how do I apply that into my, my practice without conferences like this where I get to talk to other people and then talk to researchers. The tickets for the virtual uh, admissions are $100. And even if you only watch a few of the lectures, what I, what I really want is this um, summit to succeed. Uh, these are the kinds of places where physicians like me, there's not a lot of places for the resources of not just what's happening in my practice. I can talk about that all day, but that is not evidence-based, that is anecdotal. And I need the evidence base to stay with an active license. I also need the continuing medical education. This conference offers continuing medical education. So physicians like me are able to, um, to stay in practice, to really apply and not just become YouTubers, which I've actually thought of. If I didn't have such a tough time with YouTube, I would uh, consider that. But I really love seeing patients and I love transforming this information into teachable moments and that requires you. All right, and I am gonna selfishly t say one more thing uh, about, um, check this out, this is so cool. This is my first book that I published uh, and although it sold over 100,000 copies, which is amazing, um, I'd never written a book. Uh, I self-published this and I don't have a, an editor that pushes out for reviews. I have you. And I am so close to 3,000 reviews, which is apparently some big marker on Amazon if you can get to 3,000 reviews. Um, so I am just saying, if you're looking for a way to say thank you, if you're, I read every one of these reviews. And I checked today for these reviews and saw that um, not only are we close, but there's a couple of really cute reviews that, um, I wanted to share down here, here you go. So uh, first of all, our two country actually reviewed it today and said several weeks watching YouTube. So if you're out there right now, it's nice to see you. Um, this is a great read and I am back on track on, on the keto journey. Hopefully no, no more detours, but if life happens, I know how to get back on track. So yes, we are really trying to show you on the show that I'm the real deal. I fall off the wagon. I have struggles too. I've had seasons where I wasn't as disciplined. 
Um, and I really believe it has nothing to do with my willpower. It has to do with somebody's hack. So I'm hoping to teach that as we go through this. The, lac the, <laughs> the next one has a great title. And Stu had the best uh, kind of segue into my talk tonight, so I couldn't help but read this one. He wrote it on the 9th, so thank you very much. Uh, I am a boomer too. Thank you for your candor on medical practice as it, is, it, as it developed during this period of drug therapies. And thank you for affirming the dangers of dependence on carbs. Got a lot of habits to change. Welcome aboard, I hope you're out there. But with a feeling of hope that we can help uh, more that we can help more of us. I'm about halfway through your second book, Keto Continuum. Uh, this is the best of at least a dozen or so keto books that I've read. Uh, I'll check out your website soon. Thank you, thank you, Stu. I really appreciate you putting in the effort uh, of uh, leaving the review. It is my my favorite way that folks say thank you. Uh, and again. I, I am trying to find a way that this uh, new life here in Tampa, but after 20 years of internal medicine and writing prescriptions, I do have a personal goal of stopping as many prescriptions as I've started. And part of that um, practice has been, how do I help people with peak brain performance? Um, I'm gonna take my thumb to breath here out of there. Um, peak brain performance has been my thing. I mean, internal medicine is the bread and butter, but where do I really come alive? And that is how do you help people have that best brain performance? And the ketogenic diet is clearly one of the bedrock tools that I use from uh, for, since about 2014, uh, 2015, uh, well, 2015 for sure. Uh, as you look at though, the, the danger of being in the space of trying to teach about uh, peak brain performance, um, that it's not a it's not a quick fix. Uh, I attracted a lot of folks with addiction, and uh, that addicted brain had several injuries. And changing that behavior wasn't about a prescription. It was about several of these other things that we had to teach them. And I didn't think I had any addictions. <laughs> and then I gave up carbs. Holy mackerel, do I have addictions? Mm -hmm. So, here on the Dr. Boz channel, not only do I want to help you reverse medical problems, but I talk about uh, this authentic change in your life that happens when you change a behavior that is so rooted uh, into your um, into your beginning, and that is the the improvement in a in a metabolism is something I can chemically ha have you change in a few weeks, and even in a few days for many of you, but you're all you will all fall off the wagon and go back to what you've been doing if you don't make some other really core example or core fundamental changes. And as I try to example those, <laughs> I also show you how do you fall apart? How do you screw it up? And then what do you do after that? Because it isn't about like trying this from January 1 to February 1 and then the other 11 months waiting for January 1st. We really want you on the wagon uh, doing this as consistently as possible. And I, um, I give you lots of really raw <laughs> personal data uh, to say when it comes to behavior changes, we don't play around here. I really am trying to help you reach for that. So as we look at um, the, let's go to this version. Oh, that's, I forgot to do it on this one. Um, uh, as we go, oh no, I need to turn this one around, sorry. As we go to this um, slide deck here, I have done that over the last few weeks. I'm just gonna review the notes really quickly. Several of the steps that we started with were, we want you to forget about your goals. I mean, yes, those are, they happen, but quit focusing on that. We want you to use something called the plate method to help study yourself, looking at person, location, activity, timing, and emotion for when you screw it up. I have some great examples over the last 24 hours about screwing it up, Braunschweiger being one of them, and why wasn't it a bucket of cookies? Because it could have been and it has to do with some of these uh, atomic habit uh, tricks. We talk about how in the world of changing behavior, everybody loves to say, here's what I want, here's the outcome I'm after, and they really focus on that. But that is opposite of what you should be doing. We want you looking at the identity in your, in your mind, in your soul, who are you? And that identity is shaped by habits. So if you start by fixing a habit and never change how you talk about yourself to yourself, like identifying myself as uh, I'm keto, identifying myself as healthy, identifying myself as somebody who works out again, because <laughs> I didn't for like a year and a half with 
lots of reasons why. Uh, as you look at uh, that identity shift, if you forget to put that in the process, you will have a short-lived habit change. It will not become a habit. Um, this past week, we've really been looking at the problem phase versus the solution phase. We look at the cues that people have, trying to figure out how can we make a habit more obvious? How can we really th think of that craving as something we are trying to satisfy? And could we satisfy a craving by identifying what you really want out of that behavior change? Um, we'll get uh, into making it easier, making it satisfying over the next couple of weeks. Um, and as I look at um, uh, several of the, I'm gonna change the scene over here to this one. Um, as I look at, I'm bringing up my notes over here just so I can remember how, what I was looking at. We, we um, I have a couple of uh, um, uh, anecdotes about how, when you change a behavior, when you look at the temptations that, um, let's just take the one that I screwed up in the last 48 hours, is I like to fast for 48 hours a week. I don't do that because it's fun or easy. I do that because I, I think I read more about longevity and improving uh, health than I've ever read as in my medical career. And knowing that I spent about 20 years having babies, raising kids, um, having a weight problem that wasn't terrible but was plenty above what it should be. And then uh, knowing that I did that because I I liked to comfort myself with carbs like anybody else, or like many people. And as I watched how do I change that, um, putting a fast, at least one stress of my metabolism in every week, uh, it became this schedule, it became a pattern. Um, and knowing that my previous self would have uh, said, I am a very disciplined woman, I am a you know firstborn, female from a farming family, I can do anything. I have a, you know, a, a grit and a will that can be, I mean, one of the, the ornament on my wedding cake. <laughs> uh, I got married between um, medical school and residency. So there was like a 48 hour window <laughs> where I could have a wedding. And uh, one of the assignments for my husband was uh, I delegated a lot. <laughs> I showed up with the right guy and that was the most important part. But one of the things I delegated to my husband was there's something that's supposed to go on top of a cake, like an ornament. Can you find a little figurine or something that goes on the cake? So I don't think about this again until we get to the reception. And indeed, uh, he makes a toast. He goes, for those of you that think you know my cute little wife, and she's a cute little doctor. <laughs> I mean, I just graduated from medical school. And he goes, I grew up in a town of 800 people. Uh, she's your home homecoming queen, and you think you know her, but if you're not, I would like you to search, I would like you to see the representation of who she really is. And the spotlight goes over the wedding cake, and there stands a groom, and next to the groom was a little matchbox bulldozer. And he goes, "If you're not careful, she'll just bulldoze right over you." <laughs> and my mother stood up and clapped and said, "Oh, he knows who he's marrying." <laughs> And I tell you that story because it is a drive, a will that I was like, I can do anything. I can push harder than anybody. I can work harder than anybody. And it is my sin. It is the cross I bear that when I am looking to cope, I push harder. I try harder. I pray harder. And it fails. Uh, discipline fails. That if you're finding a way through uh, how do you change a behavior. And for, I, I, mean, I turned 50 this year. For 50 years, I've been taught that carbs do make you feel better, that the Schwann's man and his ice cream bucket will help you get over what set, whatever setback you have. And when it comes to changing that, the, the first part of that change was to fix your environment, to, to change what your environment is. So we talk about this in, in Keto Continuum. I, it's not an accident that I have them clean out the cupboards, take a picture, show the people online declare that this is this new place where temptations are far away because you're right the first week of a ketogenic diet can be a little tough but then you are on this wave of improved chemistry for a good three or four weeks and then your body recalibrates and if you want to stay on that wave you have to stress it well stressing it is hard stressing it is difficult uh, it can be exercise that's one way you can stress it it can be a sauna i've done that before but I don't have access to a sauna and I was being, I wasn't exercising very much. 
Uh, so my only s metabolic stress was to fast. And uh, putting in the improvement in behavior comes from uh, how can I make this very, um, how, how can I not see the dangers of what I would typically fall into? And that is my house has to be clean. There can't, I, I don't mean not dusty, I mean clean from the temptations that I love. Uh, so that means that the bottles of wine uh, actually never get opened at the house. I take them to places and share them with other people. Um, but I also don't um, have sweets at, at the house. I don't have sugar, I just don't have it in the house. Because when I'm really ticked off or upset, I will make, um, I don't know, eggs, sugar, and flour <laughs> and turn it into some kind of pathetic cookie dough and call it therapy. Uh, and when I've had a setback, I've done that. I've had the ice cream. I've had the places where I just wanted to feel better. And it isn't, a, it isn't an accident that when you look at um, how, do you, how can you guarantee failure, it's, you can approach it like, like I did for years, which is when you want a behavior change um, and you are de determined and you are disciplined, and that is part of my identity. But it, even with that extreme uh, level of, I don't know, pushing, uh, pushing myself, uh, I, was, I failed. I failed routinely. I said, no, this just is easier and it feels better. And outside of that time where I could push back um, without having the easy grasp for the carbohydrates, uh, that environment improvement is where it began. So I, I went home last, last night, like I was saying, and I was irritated and the most carbohydrate filled thing was Braunschweiger. And I had a bite, I didn't have a lot, but I had a bite and it made today awful. I was, I was hungry again today. Uh, I had, again, a couple of setbacks and I wanted things to go right. I wanted that patient to, I, I, and so when I had that setback, I, I got hungry and I could feel the growl. And it's a good thing that this environment, the office environment, has no carbohydrates. It has some sardines, it has some carnivore crisps, um, and, I, and I, I have a, a company out there that's trying to ask me if I'll endorse some of their bars. And so there are some of the bars, but um, yeah, we're gonna talk about that on a different night. So I will, I, I, I don't think that's gonna work for me. But um, so I look at some of the other places where, uh, why, why I talk about this. When you are wiring a brain, I, I refer back to that Schwann's man and the, the ice cream um, and how my parents showed me exactly how to relax at night. It was with uh, cherry nut ice cream. <laughs> it's my mother's favorite. Uh, and it was always there. When I uh, wired my brain as a teenager, I knew that I was very active. I didn't have a weight problem. I was full of energy and I, I pushed hard then. Um, and so it was okay with, that I would have ice cream or a sweet at night to shut down. And that habit got wired into my brain. So to retrain a habit, to pull out of that and say, I, I need a different way to shut down at night. I need a different comfort. Um, it will, I will never forget how to comfort myself with carbohydrates. Once you have a habit, I mean, I've taken care of heroin addicts and alcoholics and um, people who've really been in the depths of gam sex, drugs, rock and roll, gambling, find a habit that is abus abusable and they're there. And they want to say, well, can't I improve um, that habit uh, to the point where I never have that problem again? And I tell them, no, that's not how the human brain works. You've been practicing this bad habit, especially if it starts during teenage years, during the time when your brain developed. And now that neural circuitry is present. So the way you distance from that reflex, like, and we've all had this, where you just find a problem and you find the most comforting thing that you can do that's as close as, it, it, as is possible to your, your habit, and they, they overuse it. Um, this morning I was at our support group. I had a, a mom who's been doing great, but she is the matriarch for a couple of households. She's the mom for one household, and she's the grandmother for another household, and she's been doing so good on this keto journey and now she's got some, uh, she's got the burden of having a lot of folks asking her questions she doesn't know the answers to. She's got some family members with some true health problems that she doesn't have the experience to help. And as she was worrying about them, she fell off the wagon. And her falling off the wagon was, 
almond butter. <laughs> I just think it's adorable because, yep, that is one of those things that on the keto diet you can have. Portion is very important because it'll send a, somebody with insulin resistance right up the chain of a higher blood sugar. And more importantly, it will trigger that wiring that says, oh, you remember that thing that gave you lots of pleasure? Mine was cherry nut ice cream from the Schwann's man, but hers was peanut butter. And this was really similar. And as she put that in her mouth, uh, she said, oh, I needed the next one. And usually I measure out and have just this, you know, tablespoonful. But I was like looking in the bottle of the, of the jar and saying, there, there's not that much in there. And she ate the whole thing. And I said, it is absolutely the trigger of that coping skill that once you, once you stop using it, okay, it's still there. You'll never forget it. Uh, the, the alcoholic who says, well, can't I like have a drink in 20 years? I'm like, let's talk in 20 years. But the truth is, is if the drinking was so linked to the way your brain wired to cope with that moment, that when you add the alcohol back, you will resort to saying, oh, this is what feels good. This is how you feel better. And the distance between you and that drink of alcohol is very important. Uh, so when we talk about how do you blind yourself to the, the habits, we talk about an environment that doesn't show you those temptations. Like this mom that had the, uh, the, the matri matriarch of these two homes, uh, she's like, it was really the only thing in my house that had anything close to carbohydrates in it. And, um, and uh, she ate the jar. <laughs> she, well, it was, you know, probably, you know, 90% gone, but she finished off the jar because it was that comfort she was after. That when um, the discipline that she's had to improve her life, I mean, I think she's lost like 130 pounds. She's reversed some major medical problems. Uh, she stayed the course. She's inspiring her family, her friends, her church on how healthy she is. She walked with a cane a year ago, and now she's skipping down the, to the potluck with a, a, a plate of keto food. <laughs> but uh, her discipline is never to be questioned. And in that moment where she needed comfort, she needed to say, am I doing the right thing by helping my family? The emotion of not having the answers to these questions and watching family members struggle, it triggered her. And the first step was to let's pour on um, some uh, comfort. Yeah, I'll use another example from the support group this morning too. There's another gal who says, I've been doing really well. I've been doing really well. But one of the reasons I'm doing well is because I don't, drink any of the alcohol that is highly associated with my social world. So she said, you know, I'm not, I'm not a big drinker, but my family, uh, I'm new to Tampa. <laughs> Her family is Latino and apparently, um, they know how to party. <laughs> She's not an exception apparently, but she says my family gets together. There's always an event for the family on the weekends. And as long as I had no alcohol, I did okay. But as soon as I had that first drink, in fact, she did the trick of saying, I took BHB, I mixed it in with the water, and she might have even mixed it in with alcohol this weekend. But as soon as the BHB was gone, <laughs> the alcohol reminded and triggered that neural pathway to say, oh, this is what it feels like to relax. And it's not that it's her lead coping skill, but once that had triggered, once that habit had started, uh, she definitely stepped over a threshold and said, oh, I drank way more than I was planning on. It felt really good. And now I have this, I have this cleanup problem. I've been peeing ketones and she'd had good ketone numbers for several weeks running. And the event happened on Saturday and on Monday, she still had zero ketones. I'm not sure if there were ketones today on Tuesday, but that, um, that's a long time to go, uh, without you know, falling off the wagon. She's like, I feel swollen. I don't feel sh as mentally sharp. I, I know that it was real. Uh, it's not, I knew this was a, a risk, but I had, I had no intentions of that being as much as I, you know, as much alcohol. And again, that is that same process of saying, well, what do you do? Block out and never hang out with your family? Um, and I said, no, uh, there are two versions to this. Number one, you had a good process going find the identity of who you were on those nights when you didn't drink. Um, so you're with your family, you were looking at the, the relaxation and the fun, and you were able to stay the course because you shifted your identity. Uh, 
write down who it is, who you were on the nights where you were able to stay the course. Really, I mean, she's got some weight to lose. She's got plenty of imprinting for family on, on their health problems. So as she has, you know, children and friends and family that are going to copy her, um, whether it's a good habit or a bad habit, she will influence them. Uh, I said, you know, find, find which part of your identity you can relate to during the times you were successful. And that's the part we need to ignite in your mind. That's what the self-talk needs to be about is that person is, is someone you, we want you to identify with and remind yourself of when you're getting close to those temptation scenarios. Because you can't avoid family forever, but you have to hold on to who you are in the moment. And um, my, my, my husband is quick to point out that I'm the oldest of three children and our family's had a lot of loss over the last two years. Uh, that, uh, uh, he, I think it's a syndrome <laughs> of being around my brother and sister. I instantly returned to the 12 year old girl who was just two years older than her brother and about four years older than her sister. And I'm this bossy, sassy little know-it-all that is a mother hen and I <laughs> just, I do it every time. <laughs> my sister turns into the youngest child and my brother becomes the peacemaker. And it's like these, these core identities that are very rooted in who we are awaken when the stress was high and the environment reminds us of what how we grew up. And I think um, looking at how do you, how, I mean, look, ch coming to Florida made it easy to set some new rules for the house. The office has got the same rules that we had in Sioux Falls, which is no food, I don't eat here, it's not the place to eat, it's the place to work. And then really looking at how, um, how can I set up the next layer of improvement? Because even, moving to Florida it was stressful and I wanted to relax. There's all kinds of new foods here that I've not tried. And that can be a, a, just a, a tornado of all the wrong decisions. Um, working out, my workout crew is gone. I don't have anybody to go golfing with yet. I don't know how I would fit golfing into my life right now. Uh, and I, um, my sauna used to be in my house and I don't have access to that. So there are all kinds of changes metabolically that pushing the fast became this routine. Um, being accountable by having that report show up on the live show, uh, it helped. Today, I wanted to eat. I wanted to eat so stinking bad. I wanted to find any way to go make cookie dough in the parking lot or something. But I had this accountability. I had this routine that um, isn't about the self-control, isn't about the bulldozer who can push through and do anything I, I, I set my mind to. Uh, those discipline moments are only short-lived. Uh, when you look at the long game of how do you change behavior, I really enjoy the identity of being a leader in the ketogenic space, but also in what's a, what does healthy living look like in today's world? And how can I make sure my husband does that and my children do that and my patients do that? Uh, that support group that we have on Tuesday mornings is free. I do this as a community service and a way to engage in uh, a community of people trying to get healthier. It's not convenient, I mean, I make it as convenient as I can. I want it to be routine, it's gotta be easier. But it's a support group that I wanna be around people who behave like me. So I imprint on them, but it's a selfish effect, event. I get improved by listening to their stories, by uh, advising them on, you're at a fork in the road here and here's two options. And I see you're having a tough time doing that 72 hour fast, I'll do it with you. And those moments of engaging in a support system where you're changing behavior together, uh, that is really where the strength of that temptation comes from. For the gal who has the high partying family, one of my, one of my favorite people from the support group, uh, she, she um, would do very well to partner with a sister-in-law, a niece, a cousin uh, that goes to these events and says, I'm really trying to change this behavior. Will you change with me? And that partnership strengthens both of their resolves. Like they have an accountability partner, they both end up at the place, like they come prepared to say, okay, here's my limit tonight, here's what I'm gonna do, I, I wanna have fun, I really wanna be the person who ends up healthy uh, in the next year and a half. And those goals are reaffirmed with the improvement of uh, not only blinding yourself by improving an environment of decreasing the, the number of uh, times your brain gets tempted, but also by taking away the um, 
in the, uh, and taking away the distance, but also by improving that relationship of someone who is going through the journey with you. We're going to talk more about that next week, um, too, about improving what, what's attractive. Um, the last thing I, li I like to say is that wiring your own brain is difficult. When I struggle, and let me, the last 48 hours have not been my favorite, uh, I think of my kids. I think of, had I been taught that coping with a bad day isn't about ice cream at night, uh, a better way to cope would have been to go to bed at 9 o'clock, <laughs> take a hot bath, go to bed, start the day over, get a good night's rest, and so many things go better. And even though I tell people that routinely, I don't do it as well as my kids do it. Um, and my kids do it because I do it way better than my parents did it. Uh, that process of wiring the next generation's uh, education on food, uh, coping skills, that is one of my higher motivations for continuing to do this. Um, not just for a week or two, but to stay the course, to stay consistently keto. Um, all right, well, that gets us to the end of the lesson on why we want to blind you to the temptations and how do you really partner in with some of these habits that are in atomic uh, uh, habits. And we're calling this atomic keto uh, because it really is the tiny changes that really make an explosive difference in the course of being consistently keto. We are going to answer some questions at the end. Um, I do want to just make one. Um, let me make where I wanted to go here and say, um, if my team could post the link to this, uh, it is in the show notes, but there is a, a link that gets you to this um, uh, this meter. I would love to, to just make sure that anybody who is looking for that gets access to it. And make sure you use, oops, the promo code for this is not Bosworth. It is promo code uh, BOSURIC um, to get you 50% off. That's pretty cool. Okay, so this is the other part of the show where we do what are your keto questions. Actually, let me do this for a second. Let me go here. Um, and get this set up for the right spot. Okay, so we are, oh, there's some really good questions here. Oh, nice. Um, so let me go over to, uh, here we go. So let's start with, these are the questions that were written in tonight, today, tonight. Um, and I'll move that a little bit. Uh, and go, hold on, almost there. Ooh, ooh, ah. Maybe. Hold on, I gotta fix one more thing, one thing here. Oh, there we go. All right, now it fits. Okay, so Ju Julie writes in, oh, I have adrenal fatigue. Oh, I've been working on this one. Hold on here. I want to do, let's do that. Oh, wrong one. Hold on, hold on. No, don't do that. This one maybe. One more button. <laughs> okay, I have adrenal fatigue and I have been doing low carb for the last nine months. As I was afraid to do keto because of the fasting component, is it safe to keto with adrenal fatigue? Oh, I love this question. I wonder if my team picked this out and wrote it for me. Are you real, Julie? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Julie, I have been working on a, a video series on adrenal fatigue. Adrenal fatigue is definitely one of those um, terms <laughs> It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like uh, you've heard me talk about um, leaky gut, uh, which does not have a diagnostic code. Adrenal fatigue does not have a diagnostic code. Uh, adrenal fatigue means that the adrenal glands, which are in charge of producing cortisol, producing um, the stress hormone, producing the sex hormones, uh, these are these fat-based hormones. They are derived from fat. They're derived from col cholesterol. And when, if you want to see those adrenals be really wimpy, give them a high inflammatory state with lots of insulin around. Uh, the ketogenic diet at its core, what I would have called it if somebody said, what would you name this diet? I would call it the anti-inflammatory diet. Like it removes inflammation at a cellular level. But the second word I would call it is a fat-bursting hormone diet, meaning any hormone that is built from fat becomes dwindled. Uh, our fat-based hormones are supposed to be at a very low level and then peak upon stimulation and then go back to a low level. 
Adrenal fatigue really reflects on patients who have had a chronic time of stress. Now, the stress can be high insulin, that's one stress, but the stress can also be um, poor sleep, um, the, the cortisol that's coming out of the, you know, the brain that, that pushes um, the, the, you know, your stress hormones to flood throughout your body, does it to deliver sugar. Um, the, the, corti the cortisol um, and the sex hormones uh, get this constant stimulation when they're under stress so that they are leaching out a little bit of cortisol all the time, all the time, all the time. And on the ketogenic diet, what happens is that stress decreases, uh, the amount of sugar decreases, and we want that, that adrenal to have the lowest level of function, but you then need to pump it. You need to deliver the stress and then reduce it. And I'm not saying stay up all night. I'm saying your stress of living through your life, of responding to an infection, to um, fight or flight for you know a scary movie, I don't know, some sort of stress should be peak and then relax. That one of the first things I do for my patients with adrenal fatigue, which really means you're insulin resistant. Uh, they have too much uh, sugars, they have very low ketones, their energy is poor, their brains need healed. Um, there's a vortex around the problems that the word adrenal fatigue um, is trying to say. Uh, the slide deck I'm working on for adrenal fatigue is long. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to fit it on a YouTube video yet, but it's going to be a good lecture when I get there. The punchline is the antidote for that, especially when um, they get to, let me see if I can go, let me show you one thing on here. Um, on here. Um, when I look at, uh, go to here. This, this is a slide that I made for um, uh, showing people what the three sections of the keto continuum are. You look at this baseline metabolism, and um, I don't use the word fasting until they get to 36 hours. So uh, this far column way over here, way over on the, on the other side of that slide, way at the bottom corner, is the 9, 10, 11, 12 is the stress hormones. And so um, Julie asks, could adrenal fatigue be related to, um, or could it be hurt by fasting? And I would contend that when, when we look at reducing the stress in the human body, reducing the blood sugars, reducing the inflammation, that's really the process we're trying to get you through when they become a beginner. That's that usually beautiful wave of feeling good. And then they stabilize. And now I need them to march down through, at least through continuum number six, closing that eating window from eight hours, maybe to six hours, and maybe to four hours if they can, and then holding it there because of how much reduction in the overall cortisol stress stimulation that they have, allowing the body to heal. But if you wanna see the best results for the adrenal fatigue patients, it's when you do that and then you pulse stress. You push their body to en enhance their metabolism for a short period of time. Like I said earlier on the show, I am, I am uh, stressing my system right now. I am working out, it's supposed to be twice a week. I missed, missed Monday, so hopefully I, I can say twice a week before the end of the week. We'll see how I do. Um, but at least to have a metabolic stress uh, through fasting. And it would be something that I would not push you to do right out of the gate. I would have you step through several of those steps in the keto continuum. If Just buy the workbook. The workbook is the cheapest, and you've got every step of the way that says, no, do not hop over to fasting until you really have a good job of some of those baseline metabolisms. It is probably the most important for somebody with chronic stress, which is adrenal fatigue, which is insulin resistance and they, they stabilize, they can't lose any more weight. Their body is stuck. I need you to stress the system, but you need to do it with a couple of rules in mind and that's what I go through in that workbook. Um, all right. Um, Boy, I did take up that hour. I'm gonna go a little over the hour because I started late. Um, so hang in there. Julie, thanks for that question though. I, I, it, it is something I have been working for, so watch the videos that are coming out that are not the lives, but the uploads, the ones where I spend way too much time on my slide decks to make them look pretty. All right, Susie writes in and says, Dr. Boz, what should I do if I stop losing weight? Carbs to 20 or less, ratio around 50 or 60 and I fast 16-8 with a random 72 hours. Could it be that I take 
too little calories that I, that I have stopped my metabolism. Again, uh, that is a really, it's a, it's a great question, Susie. Uh, super important to like, let me take the time to answer it too. So when you look at people who say, I stopped losing weight, could it be that my calories are too little and I need to eat more? Um, although you could get a short ter return on your restriction, you restrict the calories and say, okay, I lost a little weight, the better answer is to push the metabolism. So when I see that random 72 hour fast, 72 is really hard, so don't think you have to reach for that. But I would find a routine stress of your metabolism. Uh, the reason I would push you to say, get a 36 hour fast in every week. Uh, do that for six weeks. Um, get a 48 hour fast in every week. The ultimate where I'm really looking to reverse autoimmune disorders, the gal with the adrenal fatigue, I would get her through the first few fasts, like get a 48 hour fast in every week and then advance to a 72 hour fast. And I would be in a support group to say, can you get eight consecutive of those 72 hour fasts in a row? Eight weeks where you fast for 72 hours a week. And so you say, why, are, why would I push that? I'm, I'm struggling to lose weight and you want me to eat less calories to the point of none? I want your metabolism to rise. And you will notice that when they are in this zone, they have pretty good numbers, just like yours. Um, but what happens after a fast, the, the fasting really doesn't change their numbers too much. I mean, they, they might get a little bit better numbers, but it's like two or three days later that their mitochondria have like leveled up a notch and they really do produce a higher, higher burn, a higher energy because of that fast. So it is a true metabolic stress that we are trying to get you to do. By restricting the calories, you're, you're gonna have a race to the bottom. You can get a short window of win from that, but I wouldn't do that. I, I don't recommend my patients do that. It's not a lifetime that you get to stay there then. You've got a window that works for you. You've got, you know, 16, eight, is that what you said? Let's go back to that question. Um, um, yeah, 16, eight. Um, I, I would cut that window down actually further. Um, I would get your eating window down to six. I wouldn't reach for 72 hour fast. I would take the eating window, um, make sure it's six hours, make sure it's as close to sunrise as possible so your eating window opens up as early as possible. Um, I know people play this trick where they, you are gonna have a natural rise and fall of cortisol in the morning. And you're gonna have another rise of sugar um, when you eat. No matter if you eat keto, it's still gonna push your sugars up. If you've been insulin resistant, if you've been overweight for years, um, we need the area under the curves. And now you have two of them because sunrise gave you a curve of cortisol and sugar and eating gave you a cord rise of cortisol and sugar. The closer you can put that bolus of food uh, to the morning, the better you're gonna be. So the first thing I do is shorten the window, and this is the, the workbook does a really good job of this, where you fill in the shades of how many hours did you, what was your eating window, and we don't want it good for a day. We really want that eating window closed for six weeks. Like you're at, you know, five hours a day or four hours a day. Uh, you know, sh shrink it to six, succeed at six for at least a week or two, and then see if you lose weight at that. I've had people even be very successful at that. But almost always there's going to be a flat line. And if you're at the perfect weight and you're feeling good and you're sleeping eight hours a night, hot diggity, you win. But if not, then either close that window a little further, move it closer to the morning um, sunrise, or add a lengthy fast, meaning 36, 48 hour fast once a week until you reach your goal. All right. Um, how much does stress affect your insulin? Oh boy, does stress affect your insulin. Stress is that cortisol, uh, is, is the stimulation of your stress hormone cortisol. Cortisol's job is to tell the liver, hey, I know you've been storing some carbs. We need them released, lickety split. We need them out of the liver right now. Um, and of course, once the sugar's high, then the insulin goes high. And this is where that cycle of stress, high insulin, leads to other problems like adrenal fatigue. Like your adrenal glands are not doing what they're supposed to do. Um, because your insulin's high, because your cortisol is high, because you're stressed. So um, I love it when people are wearing a continuous glucose monitor and they don't sleep well and they notice, boy, my sugars were terrible today. And then a couple weeks go by and they do okay and then another bad night's sleep, boy, my sugars are terrible today. And it, it takes a few th cycles before they realize, huh, sleep really does affect my cortisol and sleep, uh, 
when melatonin is flowing, when your brain is sleeping and the melatonin is high, that's the opposite of cortisol. I mean, every hormone has a, a yin and a yang. When cortisol is high, melatonin is low. Uh, when the lights go off, the melatonin can go up and the cortisol goes down. And the number of hours you sleep consecutively, consecutively <laughs> is dependent on how high that mel melatonin stays. And so the opposite of stress is a good night's sleep. When you sleep through the night and you let your brain produce the melatonin, I don't mean you take melatonin, I need it produced by your pineal gland uh, to give you the benefit of that. All right, let's check the numbers at the end of the show here. I will do one more question while I do that. Uh, how, so Terry B writes in, I have been on keto for pain and they are tired. They are almost always not replacing the salt. Uh, so I, I wonder if you uh, really follow, oh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted this one. I wonder if you have um, 20 total carbohydrates or less, meaning really pushed down your carbohydrate intake. I wonder if you have a, um, if you're, you're peeing on a ketone stick, you really have improved your uh, production of ketones. And if you're stuck in insulin resistance, this is what I go through in that keto course, the, which is also what the, uh, oh shoot, where is the thing here? Oh, I don't know why I am. Get to that. Well, I got ketones of 2.8 and I think, oh, I got an error. Hold on, let's see if I can find. I have blood, but I don't have, uh, I don't have glucose, hold on. Okay. Uh, so we'll check here in just a second. So the 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 steps of somebody eight weeks into a ketogenic diet, um, I, I would want to know if you haven't lost weight, if you haven't had um, uh, production. So glucose seventy five, ketones two point eight, about the same as it was at the beginning of the show. Um, the reason I do do this is I prove to you that having ketones should increase your numbers. I know it went down, but three is pretty high. So a scoop of this should raise your ketones. In fact, that would be one thing that I would ask Terry to do is, if you had ketones in circulation, you should feel better. Um, putting them in externally, um, meaning drinking them, uh, not a bad idea, uh, especially way better than quitting because it is somebody who has a chronic inflammatory state where they're tired, they have chronic pain, uh, and their metabolism has not flipped over to the golden zone. Uh, where they can feel the improvements and have the energy that the rest of us brag about on this diet. Uh, it only happens when your body's metabolism has changed. Uh, that is what I go through on those books behind my shoulder here, Keto Continuum. Uh, that tells you a story of a patient who <laughs> kind of wanted to do it his way, but said, okay, I'll trust you, I will do it your way. And just how well his brain woke up, his mind woke up, his relationships woke up, and he lost the weight and he really did have the health of a younger man. Um, and then there's a workbook that says, what did I have him do in my clinic? I had him do these worksheets. So step one, step two, step three. And when you skip to the end and you turn on a YouTube channel that says, yeah, I mean, and there's plenty of them out there that just say, do this and you'll feel fine. I really like people to get off of all the supplements, including ketones, um, but most people come in pretty darn sick. So they need to follow some rules. And I'm guessing if you've got that problem, you're either not, you're low on magnesium, so you should go for a magnesium float, uh, you don't have enough salt, or you're really not producing ketones. You have a ketone diet, that, or a keto diet that isn't really keto. And I don't know which one of those it is, but uh, that's pretty much the top 95% of people that with that story have one of those. Ooh. All right, well that is a wrap. I have, uh, if, you've, if you wanna see what an environmental change looks like, I would encourage you to go to the first episode of the American Tradition, which is our documentary, where my sister-in-law, Michelle, we changed her environment. <laughs> she moved to the family farm. And when we say, when we change your environment, it does change how your success rate, it does change your success rate. So we did it for her, and then we put cameras around her. And so if you wanna see what that looks like in real time, check out that video, check out the series. It is a, a great little story. If you don't wanna read the book, if you don't wanna take the course, just following that documentary on YouTube gives you a huge bank of information and 
quality education. We will see you next week. I continue to improve your health one ketone at a time. Uh, we will see you next time, everybody.